Sorry, just a moment. Israel, Hamas, Hamas. and um, the Land Covenant, prophetic implications of the conflict. Prophetic implications of the conflict. Now, um, our key scriptures today are going to be Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 40. Deuteronomy 4, verse 40. Joshua 1, verse 1 to 4. Joshua 1, verse 1 to 4. Genesis 12, verse 1 to 17. Or to 7, rather. Genesis 12, 1 to 7. And then Genesis 15 verses um, 18 to 20. Genesis 15, 18 to 20. Let me repeat. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, Joshua, sorry, Joshua 1, verse 1 to 4. Deuteronomy 4, 40. Genesis 12, 1 to 7. And Genesis 15, 18 to 20. 20. Those are the key scriptures. Um, now, as Christians, we ought to base our understanding of global events on a biblical worldview. Last week, on the 12th of October, five days after the Hamas terrorists massacred Israelis in their homes and the entertainment places, of course, we know that that happened on the 7th of October, which was the last great day. 7th of October was the last great day, as the Bible calls it. And so last week, we examined the scriptures to try and get a prophetic understanding of those events, and particularly how and why Israel, with its great and sophisticated intelligence and security network, was unable to detect and avert that attack. We saw that it was probably the Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who in wanting to draw Israel back to himself, he decided to veil the Mossad, the Shin Bet, and the IDF, Israeli Defense Forces, uh, showing Israel that it is him and not the security forces that protect the nation and its peoples. And very specifically, we, we, we use the prophetic, we saw the prophetic word in Isaiah 48, verse 1 to 12, seeing that it bears out all this, Isaiah 48, 1 to 12. This was what was written uh, a thousand, a thousands of years ago about the Iron Dome, which is that wonderful technology that has now, in the eyes of the Lord, become an idol. This is what Isaiah 48 verse 5 says. <clears throat> it says that, therefore, I told you these things long ago, before they happened, I announced them to you, so that you could not say, my idols did them, my wooden image and metal God ordained them. My wooden image and my metal God. That speaks directly into the iron dome. He said, God is saying that those are idols. And we concluded that bit with verse 11 that says that, how can I let myself be defamed? I will not let my glory go to another. Um, so his, God is saying that he's not going to let his glory for the defense of Israel go to the iron dome and the Mossad and so on. We also understood from that same passage that the pain that Israel is going through is something that God has allowed. Um, it is a refining, as spelled out in verse 10, which says that, I see I have refined you, though not as silver. I have tested you in the furnace of affliction. I have refined you. So it is a refining. So God is saying that he's not that he will not let yield his glory to others. 
<clears throat> whether it is systems or, or technology or institutions. Now, earlier on, we saw that the very same thing had happened uh, 50 years earlier on the 6th of October, 1973, when God let the Arab armies invade undetected and shake up Israel as never before to begin the Yom Kippur War. So on both occasions, 1973 and 2023, he, happened, he, let, he let these uh, attacks happen on high holidays, the Day of Atonement, and then on the conclusion of the Feast of Tabernacles on the eighth day, um, which on these high holidays, they are supposed to have, we are supposed to have even closer communion with him. And so we also saw again from scripture that the Hamas attack on the kibbutz was prophesied thousands of years ago in Ezekiel uh, chapter 38. And it happened in exactly the fashion that is described in the scriptures. Now, the reason all this is happening is because the Kairos time for the fulfillment of this particular prophecies has come. Now, Jesus told us in Matthew 5, 17 that all prophecy will be fulfilled. Now, some prophecy has already been fulfilled. Adam prophecy is multifold. It will be fulfilled and be fulfilled at various times. And then other is yet to be. And so because the word of God is a living God, it is made manifest many times when prophecy gets fulfilled. Um, and let's remember that all genuine prophecy must reflect scripture. Otherwise, it will simply be divination or what the Bible calls false prophecy and which actually at the end of the day is sorcery. So let's always try to match prophecy. Prophecy must reflect scripture. Now, um, <clears throat> last week we also got an understanding, again from scripture, that God uses or used the Philistines to keep uh, Israel on a leash to wake them up. Um, and that one is in Judges chapter 3, verse 1, 3. And we also saw that the struggles of Saul and David in 1 Samuel, uh, in which the um, Philistines were watching gleefully on the side, were reminiscent of the divisions that have, uh, that have typified the Israeli establishment in this last one year, as the executive and legislature were flexing muscles with the judiciary uh, to the delight of Israel's modern enemies. So it happened between Saul and David uh, 3,000 years ago, and it is happening again now. We also saw that this year, <clears throat> 2023, is 75 years since the modern state of Israel was formed, and that the prophetic significance of uh, the number 75 is that it is symbolic of close intimacy with God. 75 calls for close intimacy with God, which is what happened with uh, Abraham and also with Isaac, 75, 75. We concluded by seeing that the Lord is a God of covenant who, in spite of his anger, would not abandon Israel. A point he makes clear again in that same scripture, that same passage, um, Isaiah 48, where he says that for the sake of my praise, I'll not hold it back from you so as not to cut you off. And he has said numerously through history that he fights for Israel. He also wants to be in close communion with this nation, which is why that attack was a wake up call. So that things do not continue as usual, um, of, um, which is really trusting, simply trusting in human abilities and technology. Um, today, we are again going to put on prophetic lenses to try and understand the goings on since the attack and to see what God says in his word, to get a picture of where things could be headed to, and most of all, to help us um, to pray with knowledge and understanding. <clears throat> and so now the focus is on Gaza. Let me give a very brief history of contemporary Gaza, contemporary. Um, The Gaza Strip is a narrow 25 uh, mile stretch of land that is pressed against the Mediterranean Sea between Israel and Egypt. 
In length, it is the equivalent of Kampala to Lugazi. Kampala to Lugazi, 25 miles. And in width, it is the equivalent of moving from city square to Seguku. Those of you who are familiar with Kampala and uh, Entebbe Road, the Entebbe Highway. So it is quite narrow. It's about six or seven miles in width, six, seven, eight miles. Of course, it varies at certain points, but it's quite narrow and the length is that. So narrow and very small. Now, when Israel established, was established in 1948, many Palestinian uh, refugees moved, were forced to move into the strip, that strip of land. In 1967, Israel gained control of Gaza after its victory in the Six Day War against Egypt, Syria, and Jordan. Now, there was an, uh, an uprising in the year 2000, a Palestinian uprising that unleashed a new wave of violence between the Israelis and the Palestinians. And so in 2005, the year 2005, Israel decided to leave Gaza, withdrawing its troops and removing uh, 9,000 Jewish settlers who had been living there. Now, this week, today, tomorrow, this weekend, coming weekend, Israel is set to return to Gaza. And this is what we are seeking to get a, a prophetic understanding of. Um, let me see if I can um, uh, project. I would like to project something. I hope I have rights to share a screen just for us to see where we are. Um, no, that's not it. This is not it. Uh, Uh, is the screen coming on? I'm trying to share. Uh, yes, it is on. Is it the map? Uh, um, my things are a little bit. Mm -hmm. No. Huh? It's not. Wish. Introduction. Uh. I think my stuff got mixed up. I wanted to show you the map of... Uh, the map has come. Okay. All right. So what you see before you is the modern map of, uh, of Israel. And at this corner here, this is Gaza. Gaza in this corner. You can see up against the um, Mediterranean Sea. And so the places that were raided last week, last week uh, around here, you can see that is Ashkelon, uh, Sderot is around here. And uh, they've been up to now, they're still trying to, to bomb or to send rockets to Tel Aviv. So this is modern. Israel, or yes, modern Israel, and this is the Gaza Strip. This is the West Bank where most of the um, Palestinians live. The West Bank in um, in scripture is what we know as uh, Samaria and bits of Judea, just a little bit of Judea, and that's the Galilee. This is the Negev. So that's modern Israel, and I'll come back to that shortly. Um, and so Israel is determined to deal a de decisive blow on Hamas. And anytime now it's going to go into uh, in a ground offensive. Now, interestingly enough, <clears throat> that ground offensive that they are planning is in keeping with various prophetic words. Now, for instance, uh, in seeking an antidote to the Philistine menace, King David, it is written in 2 Samuel, Chapter 5, verse 17, it's written that King David went down to the stronghold. So that's the thing that um, these people want to do. They want to go down to the stronghold, as their ancestor uh, David did, 2 Samuel 5, 17, and he defeated them. The demand that the Palestinians leave northern Gaza and head south is also... Um, resonating with another prophetic word. In Zephaniah uh, chapter two, verse four, uh, it is prophesied that 
Gaza will be abandoned. Gaza will be abandoned. That's a prophetic word spoken through the prophet, prophet Zephaniah. <clears throat> While the de devastation that we're already seeing is reflected uh, in yet another prophetic word, the prophet Jeremiah, uh, Jeremiah 47, verse 5. Now, Jeremiah um, chapter 47 is, is a prophetic word on a judgment on, Philist on Philistia, or which we know as Gaza today. So 47 verse 5 says that boldness has come upon God, boldness, bold like in bold-headed Iwarata. So that, that flattening that we are seeing now is something that was prophesied. You know, these are words of the Bible. It's amazing. Then in Zechariah chapter 9 verse 5, it was prophesied that Gaza will writhe in agony. Gaza will rise, writhe in agony. Now, these three prophetic assertions speak into what is happening right now as we close the second week of the conflict. What then, uh, dear friends, comes after? Whichever way things pan out, there is a long-term imperative, and this is where the land covenant comes in. Whichever way these things go, we've seen uh, yesterday President Biden was there in, uh, in Israel. Today, the British Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, has been, I think he spent the day in uh, Tel Aviv, and now he's flying to Saudi Arabia. Uh, the German Chancellor was there a few days ago. So people are trying to settle these things. But whichever way they do, the land covenant must come in. And so let's put on our prophetic lenses and we examine what is before us. And here, prophetic implies an analysis and understanding of God's word with spiritual eyes. So let's do, <laughs> let's just do it in a, symbolically. Put on spiritual eyes. For me, I put on mine. I hope you also can do. And so, <laughs> friends, what I'm sharing aims not at passing judgment. We don't, we're not trying to pass judgment or to strengthen rigid positions, no. It is we are trying to equip ourselves with knowledge so that we pray with understanding because we are called to pray. We are intercessors. We are called to pray. So at the root of the geopolitical order of that part of the world, all these conflicts are always about ownership of the land. The story of the Bible is centered on Israel, as we all know, right from Genesis chapter 12 when Abraham is introduced through the slavery, the exodus, the establishment, the kings, the wisdom writings, the prophets, the gospels, the epistles, right down to the conclusion of the book of Revelation. And in this is weaved, into this is weaved the, uh, the story of the land. <clears throat> when Abraham was called by God, he was, to, he was called to go to a land God would show. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, a land that God would show. And then that was followed by the promise in verse 7, uh, Genesis 12, verse 7, that to your descendants, I will give this land. And so the promise, um, to that promise, that go to a land that I will show, okay, and to your descendants, I will give this land to that promise. There was a stamp that sealed, that sealed it in the form of a covenant. And that one is found in Genesis chapter 15, verse 18. Genesis 15, this is when the covenant is made with Abraham. It says that on that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham and said, to your descendants, I give this land from the wadi, of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Kadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Gargashites, and the Jebusites. The Jebusites, now those around who lived around Jerusalem. And again, let me let me try to show a map. I believe, let me, let me project a map. Uh, Share screen. 
Um, is it showing? Yes. Okay. So <laughs> this is the map that the outline, the red outline, is the land promised by God in uh, Genesis 15, 18. Genesis 15, 18. That is the extent of the land. So you can see how much more will still have to be done sometime in future. Probably not in our lifetimes, but because it is a covenant of God, because it's a promise, because it is a prophetic word, it will have to be fulfilled. So that is the outline that um, that's the wording. Remember, it says the wadi of Egypt. Okay. This around here. The wadi is really along the, the Nile. And then <clears throat> to the great river, the Euphrates. And then these are the lands of the Kenites, the Canaanites, and, and so on. They are all around here. So that's the promise that God made um, to, to, to Abraham. And so when the children of Israel crossed into the promised land under the leadership of Joshua, this is what the Lord says to Joshua. He says that um, my, my Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise and go over this Jordan, you and all these people, to the land which I am giving them, the land of Israel. Every place that, you, that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you, as I said to Moses, from the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and to the great sea towards the going down of the sun, sun shall be your territory. So that's the word of God. That's the promise. That's it. So when we read such passages, there are certain questions that inevitably arise. These are some of the questions for me that I've always had in my mind and that I've seen elsewhere. <clears throat> what is the land that God promised to Israel? I think I spelled that a bit. Another question is, does this apply to contemporary Israel, today's Israel? What right does Israel have to the land in Gaza today, today in October 2020? What right? Another question is, did God give Israel the promised land for all the time? Is it for all the time? Fourth question, has Israel's land ever encompassed the promise of Joshua 1 for the scripture we just, raised, we just read? And then question number five, is Gaza part of this land? Now, all these are legitimate questions. And as we attempt to answer them, uh, we should first get an understanding of God's covenant. Now, in a biblical sense, the word covenant derives from the same root meaning to cut, to cut. Um, this means that in the culture of the Bible, covenant uh, carried weight and was often cut or sealed in blood, in blood. Uh, in Luganda, I think there is something in, in Uganda culture, there is something called Okuta or Mukago. Okuta or Mukago, our forefathers used to make covenants and were sealed in blood, um, those ancient covenants of our people. And so <clears throat> covenants are crucial because the Bible is not just a random collection of laws or moral principles and stories. It is a story that goes somewhere. It is the story of redemption is a story of God's kingdom. And the sto that story unfolds and advances through the covenants that God made with his people. And so if we don't understand the covenants, then we will not and cannot understand the Bible because we won't understand how the whole story fits together. Covenants are the backbone of the biblical story with the, um, uh, the covenant, with Abraham playing a central role in the biblical storyline. God promised Abraham, he promised him three things. He promised him offspring, then he promised him land, and he promised him universal blessing. Universal blessing. And of course, we know uh, the promise to Abraham finds its culmination in Jesus Christ. 
who is the true son of Abraham. We read that in Galatians 3.16. And so all of us who belong to Jesus by faith are the children of Abraham. That's what we learn from Galatians 3.16. Then secondly, covenants are everlasting. The phrase everlasting covenant or perpetual covenant is used no less than 16 times in the Old Testament and at least once in the New Testament. And it always refers to a covenant promise of God to man made in grace, for only God can make an everlasting promise. So virtually all the covenants have both conditional and unconditional elements. And all but one of God's covenants with man are eternal and unilateral. The only one that is no longer there is the mosaic one, you know, the one of the law. So if people, if you want to understand, you know, people, we read it in the New Testament that we are no longer under the law. Yes, it is true. And what is that law? It is the law that was given in the mosaic covenant. That one ceased to be and it was replaced by the, um, by the new covenant. But other is all the other covenants in the Old Testament or wherever else in the New Testament, they are they are they are still there they haven't gone away and so we understand that they are eternal and they are unilateral why are they unilateral because god promised to accomplish something based on his own character okay in these covenants he promised to accomplish something on his own character not on the response or actions of the promised beneficiary and so Let's not look at the actions of the beneficiary. In this case, Israel. No, his, his God's covenant is not dependent on, on what Israel does. In any way in which his covenant promise to my life is dependent on, on, on me. He has made a covenant promise. And because he's a God of the covenant, he's unilateral, he's the one who decided. Amen. So let's begin to uh, answer those questions quickly. What is the land that God promised to Israel. Now, of course, there's probably no more, no, uh, there's no part, land more disputed in the world, not even this Ugandan land, these good plots we fight for. There is none greater than the land of Israel. In fact, even calling it Israel can raise objections from certain quarters. Now, the, the Jewish people lay claim to the land, to that land that we're talking about, because they first held possession of it many millennia ago, three and a half millennia ago. And because God directly gave them that land as recorded in the Bible, we've read some of the scriptures. So that's question number one and its answer. Question number two, <clears throat> was Gaza part of the biblical land? Was Gaza part of the biblical land? Now Gaza first appears in the Bible in Genesis 10, 19, when it is demarcated as an outer border of Canaan. Now, this is important from the first book of the Bible uh, because Gaza was, it means it was considered geographically part of the Holy Land. Now, this inclusion was later reinforced when Gaza was listed among Judah's promised territories. In, you can read that in Joshua chapter 15, verse 20 and verse 47. Joshua 15, 20 and 47, which says, uh, 47 speaks of the borders to the sea of the Philistines, borders to the sea of the Philistines. That is the sea of the Philistines, that's the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, Exodus 23, 31. So while Gaza was part of the land promised to the Jews by God, it was never part of the land actually conquered and inhabited by them in the conquest by Joshua. It was inhabited by the Philistines, and God decided that the Philistines would, he would preserve them as a bulwark to sharpen Israel's military skills. We read that scripture very well last week, Judges chapter 3, verse 1 to 2. God left the Philistines there so that they can help. This, or they can, or rather, he can use them, not help. They are not helping, but he uses them to sharpen the military skills of, of the Israelites. So that's um, Gaza and the Bible, but biblical land. Then the third question here is, has Israel's land ever encompassed the promise of Joshua 
chapter 1, verse 4. Now, in Joshua 1, for God promised Joshua that the land of Israel would include territory extending from the desert to Lebanon, from the great river, the Euphrates, and to the Hittite. Now, I think I, I showed the map on that. As of yet, Israel has not controlled this entire area. In Joshua's time, much of the land of Canaan was brought under Israelite control. In the time of David <clears throat> and his son Solomon, which came about 400 years after Joshua, a wide area of the land was under Israel's control and influence. And yet, the entire territory promised to Israel um, in scripture, in both Joshua 1, 4, and elsewhere, has yet to be fulfilled. I don't know if I need to project that again, but I think we are not doing well on time. Now, what right has Israel? The next question, what right has Israel to the land in Gaza today, this today in October 2023? Biblically speaking, Israel has every right to possess, occupy um, in all these places in the West Bank, in the Golan Heights, in Gaza, and so on. Now, all of those territories were well within the land that God promised. Israel currently occupies or possesses a fraction of the land the word of God declared long ago in the scripture that just read Genesis 15, 18 and Joshua 1, 4. So unless the Palestinians are descendants of the tribes of Israel, which is possible if we can do some very good mapping, they have absolutely no biblical claim to live on those lands. Biblical claim. I'm talking about biblical claim. Whatever the case, they have no biblical basis for preventing the nation of Israel from occupying and, uh, and building in those territories. So that is the claim on Gaza. It's a biblical thing. The next question, did God give Israel the promised land for all the time, for all the time? That's always a question of contention. I would say in uh, one word, yes, he did. Now let's go back to scripture. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 40, <clears throat> the Lord gave the Israelites this command. Keep his decrees and commands which I am giving you today so that it may go well with you and your children after you and that you may live long in the land the Lord your God gives for all time. Let me repeat. This is Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 40, keeping his decrees and commands, which I am giving you today so that it may go well with you and your children after you, and that you may live long in the land the Lord your God gives you for all time, for all time. How much time? All time. So does that mean that God gave Israel the promised land in perpetuity? Now, what we see in this passage, Deuteronomy 4.40, it contains a conditional offer, a conditional offer. Israel was to have the promised land as they kept God's de decrees and commands, as long as they kept these decrees and commands. They had to obey God's statutes in order to remain in the land. Now, history reveals that the Israelites often disobeyed, resulting in temporary times of exile from their land because of disobedience. Related question, how long is for all time? For all time, how long is for all time? Now, in the book of Revelation, we see Israel as a center of focus. In the end times, Israel faces many difficulties, yet that tribulation concludes with the Messiah reigning from his throne in Jerusalem. When we read the book of Revelation, the Messiah, it, uh, this, this time of tribulation concludes with the Messiah reigning from his throne in Jerusalem, which is the capital of Israel. And so the book of Revelation concludes with a new heaven, a new earth, and a new Jerusalem. And so when we go back to Deuteronomy 4.40, we see that that passage is a, 
It's a, it's a promise that sees far. It is a far seeing see promise extending to the end of the world's, this world's existence and even into the time of the new earth. There, however, is a challenge that contemporary Israel has to address even as it goes into Gaza anytime and hope and uh, it's hope to realign the socio-political uh, uh, jigsaw uh, for its long-term stability. We shall shortly come back to this. Now, Gaza is a complicated place. In terms of the prophetic books, we saw, we, we've seen four prophets, at least four prophets warning Gaza of impending doom. This week, people have been circulating uh, Amos chapter 1, verse 6 to 8, you know, the one that talks about punishment for taking uh, for taking um, hostages. You know, that one predicts, predicts a divine fire that would consume uh, Gaza's walls. But we've also seen in Zephaniah chapter 2, verse 1 to 4, that they will be deserted. Then Jeremiah 25 and uh, 47, you know, and then Zechariah chapter nine. So all these, they prophesy that Gaza will tremble in fear. Now, <laughs> the interesting thing is that these prophets lived in different times. Amos lived around 250 years, two and a half centuries after Zechariah, or rather before Zechariah. And so these promises uh, indicate a protracted and ongoing negative engagement of Gaza. Biblical Gaza does seems to have been as much a shambles as it is today. It's been it was a, as much a mess, you know, the biblical one has is the current one. I mean, if you remember Samson's travels, Samson's travels were in Gaza. And so, <clears throat> although it was part of ancient Israel's borders, it was rarely fully conquered or controlled. Joshua conquered the lands of the Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Evites, the Jebusites, 31 kings in all, but he did not conquer Gaza. Uh, and it remained inhabited by hostile and, you know, occasionally violent neighbors. Just like modern Gaza, it remained a constant source of tension as while Israel was struggling to cement its foothold in the land that God had promised uh, their ancestors, therefore their yes, ancestors, their forefathers. Now that situation is unlikely to change unless Israel goes into full-blown obedience to God, relying on Him and not on their what is admittedly very good intelligence and very sophisticated weapons. Should they not? Uh, obey God fully? Should they just rely on their sophisticated weaponry, on their very good intelligence? They will not settle this Gaza problem. That's the lesson that the Bible puts out. And for me, that's the prophetic word that uh, God has brought for us right now in this season. Now, in the next few weeks, Israel is likely to occupy much of Gaza in the next few weeks. But then what? What happens after that? This is where the principles of royal covenants could come into play. And for us to understand how matters are likely to pan out in Gaza, let us analyze this principle of royal covenants. We have seen that God wants Israel back to himself, which is why he has sounded the wake up call in this time, in, this, in, the, in the last 12 days. We have also seen that Gaza is part of the land that was promised and that that promise in the form of a covenant is perpetual because it was sealed in covenant. However, it is also conditional to the beneficiary it is conditional to the beneficiary, not God, but to the to the the beneficiary. What's the principle? This is the principle. The principle is that kings grant. Once a king grants you something, in this case, uh, the king, the king of kings, 
granted land to Israel, the king of kings who is God granted. So once a king, a king's grant is given for loyal or exceptional service, first of all, it is at the king's prerogative. That's number one, it's at the king's prerogative. Now the grant is normally perpetual and unconditioned. However, and here's the key point, the, 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 if, if, the, if the king is giving, is giving a royal grant to a servant, the servant's heirs benefit from it only as much as they continue their father's loyalty and service. As long as they continue, you know, the descendants, the heirs, or Musika, will only benefit as long as he or she uh, continues uh, the father's loyalty and service to that king. Now, that principle, we see that principle in 1 Samuel chapter 8. Samuel, the judge, he had benefits as the chief judge of Israel. We read in 1 Samuel chapter 8 that when he grew old, he made his sons judges over Israel. However, because they were corrupt, they lost the opportunity and the benefits, and the leadership was soon turned over to kings, of course, beginning with Saul, who the people demanded. And so Samuel had been given a clean slate. He wanted to move it on with his children. But because they did not continue their father's loyalty, Samuel was loyal to the king of kings but they could not continue in that service. Then they lost it. Elsewhere, in Esther chapter eight, verse one, Esther chapter eight, verse one, Haman's estate was turned over directly to Queen Esther because now Haman was no longer, was deemed no longer loyal to the king, to king's success. He was deemed, uh, what do they call it? Uh, yes, he was deemed to be treasonous. He had, he had, he had, um, yeah, he was guilty of treason. And so his, his, uh, his estate, you can read it in Esther chapter eight, verse one. It is, turned, it is given directly to Queen Esther and her uncle also comes in the picture as the manager of that estate, her uncle, Uncle Mordecai. <clears throat> it got me thinking when I was trying to understand these principles, that in my family, I, Sepuya, the family where I come from, we call our ancestral land what actually it is not. What we call our ancestral land where, you know, my father and my, about five generations of my family are uh, uh, buried and, and where we have quite a bit of land. We call that ancestral land, but actually it is not our ancestral land. That land was given by the king, the Abaka, to my great grandfather. A man who was called Manyangi, and it was given to him about 150 years ago for battlefield exploits. Um, the, the, the story is told that uh, this grandfather of ours, Mr. Manyangenda, fought in a, a battle around Entebbe. Entebbe, that's about, yeah, that was about 150 years ago. And so the king, I wonder which king that was, then maybe Kawaka Suna or whoever it was anyway. So the king, pleased with this gentleman, he gives him that land. This land is... Uh, somewhere on the northern part of Wakiso district. And so Mr. Manyangenda and his family moved from wherever they were much further on uh, in Luero district, they moved to this place. That was the, the, the king giving a royal charter to a faithful servant. Now, none of us with the fifth generation descendants know of his service or let alone the covenant that he had with the Kabaka. We do not know. And maybe it does not surprise that our benefit from the land is fairly limited. Our benefit has been quite limited. But I'm beginning, I'm seeing it afresh that it is uh, it's because of those principles. So similarly, <clears throat> Israel's holding on to the land, onto, onto land has been contingent on their obedience of the values of God the giver of that land. The expulsions of uh, Israel's um, um, ancestors from
from the promised land was due to disobedience of God's statutes, like the exile to Assyria and Babylon, that was because of uh, idolatry and so on, and the scattering in the nations. So should, should Israel, the current, the modern Israel, take Gaza in the near future, their ability to hold it with little trouble while making actual gains, you know, actual gains. Remember the benefits to the to the uh, to, to to the heirs, you know, their ability to hold on to it while making actual gains will be contingent on obedience of God's statutes, because that is what God said in Deuteronomy chapter four, uh, uh, in Deuteronomy chapter four. They will be in the land as long as they live by the statutes. And so God offered blessings within the promised land conditionally related to Israelites' obedience. Let me just repeat that, that scripture, Deuteronomy 440. Keep the decrees and commands which I am giving you today so that it may go well with you and your children after you and that you may live long in the land the Lord your God gives you for all time. So this contains a conditional of Israel would have the promised land as they kept the decrees and commands. They had to obey God's statutes in order to remain in the land. We've seen that history shows that whenever they disobeyed, then they are exiled. So any territorial gains that are made in this latest phase, you know, what is happening this week, this month, is the latest phase of an age-old struggle will only be kept and enjoyed if there is obedience to God's statutes. Beyond being descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the present-day Israelites have to emulate their forefathers. Otherwise, their struggle is going to be in vain. They are going into uh, Gaza will be in vain. Saul was disobedient, and he died in battle against the Philistines. Contrary to Saul, David was obedient, even seeking God's say before battle, you know, before going into battle. David would ask, Lord, should I go? Should we go? How should we go? What's the strategy? And what was the benefit? He extended the reach of the kingdom in the promised land. When David's son Solomon assumed leadership of Israel, he even built a dwelling place for God, the great temple in Jerusalem, which, is the, which was the capital of Judah, and is the capital of Israel, the, the first temple. And it was in that time that the kingdom spread to its greatest reach ever. Now, contrary to Solomon and David, the successors, the successors of Solomon were corrupt and evil. And the kingdom now shrunk. And so, friends, these principles are neither limited in time nor are they limited in faith. The way they happened 3,000 years ago, they can play again today. Remember, 3,000 years ago, according to God's word, is like, you know, we read that a day to God, a day, a thousand, a thousand years is like a day. So, if we use that, it means that to God, what happened 3,000 years ago, okay, under David and Solomon, is like, today is what, Thursday, it's like what happened on Monday. So for him, it is just a recent week thing. So because these principles are not limited in time, nor are they limited in space. So the, the Bible, well, let me begin to conclude. The Bible teaches us that God will eventually fulfill the promise to give Israel full control of the promised land. Israel's full territory will ultimately be ruled by the Messiah during the millennium. You know, that's another topic for another day, but Revelation 20 verse 1 to 6. Now, God's promises, partly fulfilled throughout history, will have complete literal fulfillment prior to God's creation of new heavens, and a new earth. Let me finish. We see that with the events advancing on the battlefield uh, this week, next week, 
even with that, God still wants Israel back to himself. Um, the position that we have come to understand was foundational to the beginning of this conflict 12 days ago. And that God is taking, uh, was taking Israel through a furnace of affliction, not to cut them off. This war and this conflict can serve as a metaphor for our own lives, you and I, we as believers. God has a covenantal relationship with those who have accepted the salvation that he has to offer through his son. But when we live in rebellion, when we fail to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, we risk uh, uh, falling out of his grace. So to hold on to that, uh, to the covenant, to enjoy the benefits, we have to be obedient. He says in uh, Deuteronomy chapter seven, verse nine, Deuteronomy 7, 9 says that, therefore, no, therefore that the Lord, your God is God, is the faithful God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. Let me repeat that, Deuteronomy 7, 9. Know therefore that the Lord, your God, is God, faithful God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. Deuteronomy 7, 9. Now, here's a very good example. When Abraham was shown the land, okay? We are now going back to, Revel uh, to Genesis chapter 12. When he was shown the land, Genesis 12, 7, it says that there he built an altar to the Lord. As soon as he was shown the land, he built an altar to the Lord. That is the standard that Abraham gave, not only to the Israelites and the modern day Israelis, but even to us, to we, his descendants, because we are his descendants in the faith. What an example. There he built, as soon as he was shown the land, he built an altar. That is what Israel should be doing. This is what we, you and I, should be doing. Shalom. Thank you very much, and God bless you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Fukuya. Uh, let me see. We don't, I don't seem to see any, any, any questions. Okay, let me first read the responses. Thanks uh, from Lenny, Mr. Mdisha. Thanks, David. How do all those covenants you are referring to in the Old Testament sit with the new and everlasting covenant, the blood of Jesus? Number two, the current state of Israel, Israel denies the Lordship of Jesus Christ and persecutes his followers. So what's Israel in God's sight today? You can start with that. You don't no, let me answer that one. Um, there are uh, seven key covenants in the Bible, seven key covenants, there are others, but seven, which is the number of completion. The first one is the Edenic covenant, what he makes, uh, the, the covenant that God makes with um, uh, at the beginning of when he makes the world and he puts in um, uh, Abraham, uh, no, what's his name, uh, Adam and Eve. The second key covenant is the Noah, Noahic covenant which was made, remember, when he said that no longer shall he destroy the world. That is the second key covenant. Now, those two are made with all humanity, made directly with all humanity. The third one, the third key covenant is the Abrahamic covenant, which we have just read. Uh, we've been dealing with the promise to bless and the promise of the land, the promised land. Then the Mosaic Covenant, the one he makes with Moses at the foot of the mountain. Or that it's called the Mosaic Covenant or the Sinaitic Covenant. <clears throat> then the next covenant is the covenant of, um, with um, um, the Davidic Covenant, that his throne will be, will be the... Um, uh, an everlasting throne, and it is from that where 
uh, Christ comes in. Then the, the seventh covenant is the new covenant. The one that promises us Christ. I think that's found in Jeremiah 33. I think it's Jeremiah 33. And so those are the seven. Now, according to the Bible, if we go to uh, Romans chapter 9, I think it's verse 4, the Israelites are the people of the covenant. Now, some of those covenants were made directly with them, but for all of us. Others were for mankind in general. Now, the new covenant, which is what gives us Christ, is what did away with the Mosaic covenant, because that one was the covenant of the law. So we are no longer under the law, but we are under the the um, uh, uh, under the grace that Christ brings. So that one takes took its place. However, God also says, okay, let me read that in uh, about the rest of the covenants. So 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 that overrides the mosaic, overrides the law. However, as far as the rest are concerned, um, they are, they will not go away. They are eternal. This is what it says in, uh, in Romans 11, verse 20, 28 and 29, that as far as the gospel Paul is concerned, they are enemies on your account, our enemies. But as far as their election, this, these are the Israelites. As far as their election is concerned, they are loved on account of the patriarchs for God's gifts and his call, his covenants are irrevocable. So he has not revoked them. The only covenant he has revoked is the one, the mosaic one. The rest still stand. Now, Again, we learn from uh, Romans 11 that we are, to, uh, actually we, we are blessed, close my Bible, um, that the salvation of the, of the Jews will, will come after. As long as they are disobedient, it's giving us a, 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 um, an opening, a, um, an opening, yes, for us to to come to salvation. So that is the blessing. That is the blessing. But God is in a covenant relationship with them, which he has not turned, which he has not stopped, because those things are irrevocable. Amen. Thank you so much, David. Uh, I'm seeing I'll another question that. here uh, from Joanita. So should Israel raise an altar in Gaza immediately they occupy? Now for me, going by biblical, by what the scriptures say and what many of us have learned in a practical way, in a practical Christianity, it is critical to raise an altar in a place that is going to be of permanent, um, permanent abode, so to speak. Be it a, a home, a house, you know, you raise an altar, Beat in the workplace. Yes. So for me, it makes sense that they should raise an altar in a plan. That's part of it because the standard was shown by their 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 great their, their ancestor, their forefather, Abraham. So yes, that's the long, that's the short answer to your question. Thank you. Okay, there is also one from Mr. Mr. One from Dr. Rose Carbonjo. And one from Mr. Uh, Robi Muhumza. Um, Rose says, how should we pray? And then how should we pray then? Considering all that what you have shared. Number two, quickly, what is the fate of the Palestinians in Gaza? Is it destruction? Is it refugees in Egypt? Is it coexistence under Jewish leadership in Gaza or what else? In just two minutes, because we have run out okay. of time. All right. Um, as far as the uh, um, the fate of the Palestinians, what the Bible says is they are they should live in coexistence. Let me read that scripture. 
in um, yes, um, Ezekiel forty-seven verse twenty-one that you are to distribute this land among yourselves according to the tribes of Israel. You are to allot it as an inheritance for yourselves and for the aliens who have settled among you and who have children. You are to consider them as native born Israelites. Along with you, they are to be allotted an inheritance among the tribes of Israel. In whatever tribe the alien settles, you are to give, they, there you are to give him his inheritance. So that's the answer. The answer is there in scripture. I said it, God, because Prophet said it was spoken. Under Jewish leadership, yes. That's it. That's what God says. What was the other question? How should we pray? Yeah, I think uh, the critical thing is to pray for, for Israel, to pray for prophets in Israel to understand what they are, they are God. They are God. I'm, <laughs> he's also our God, but I'm saying it in the sense that he's called the God of Israel. He's called the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Prophets to understand, to pick what their God said and what, um, and, and yes, and therefore pray into it and get, let, let, let the society understand. That is why God wants them back so that they can understand what he has said. Because all solutions to these matters are with him. And all of them are, you know, the great thing is that they are provided for in the Bible. They've already, they've already, um, they've said, yeah. It's already, the, the solutions are there. It's all in the Bible. It's all in the Bible. So we should pray that um, they get an understanding of what it is God. You know, I said last week that they missed, in 1973, they missed the message. So our prayer is that they do not miss the message yet again. 50 years later, they shouldn't miss the message. That should be our prayer. That their eyes are open, their, ear, their ears, but here their eyes are open. And their minds are open to what? Um, the, the, the Hebrew scriptures, as some of them call the Old Testament, but the Hebrew scriptures say, but also the entirety of God's word says. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Sepuya. Can I call uh, Mr. Robin Muhumza in two minutes to give us closing prayer? The rest of the prayer direction Mr. Sepuya has shared. The recording will be posted on Telegram and other various uh, IFU platforms. You can also go to, you can also search. Um, we can't take more questions because there is a class coming in, Rose. I'm very sorry, but you can ask uh, Mr. Priya privately. Um, Mr. Let's have Mr. The mm. Can I pray now? Yes. Let's have a closing word of prayer. Our Lord and Master, I want to thank you for your servant, David Sepia, for his diligence, for his willingness to study, wait upon you, hear your word, and share it without fear or favor, Lord God. Mm -hmm. And so we, as your children, Lord God, want to pray that your will be done. We want to pray, Lord God, for the leadership in Israel to hear your word and obey the Lord God. The God of Israel may go ahead to lead your people to victory, Lord God. May they turn to you and serve you and fulfill your purpose, Lord God. One pray, Lord God, even for the Palestinians who are in the land, that they may get to know you, to know your will, abide by your will, Lord God, that they will coexist with the people who put in leadership, Lord God. And at the end of the day, your name may be glorified, your kingdom will be extended. And pray, Lord God, a special prayer for David, your servant, for your hand of protection around him. Protect him with your angels. Give him good health, Lord God. Protect him from the enemy. May you continue to use him, Lord God, to extend your kingdom, speak your word of prophecy and teach. And the rest of us, Lord God, as we pray, May we pray with wisdom, understanding, and knowledge in your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Amen. Amen. Amen. Amen. Amen. Amen. Amen. Amen. Amen. Amen. Amen. Amen. Amen. Amen. Amen. Amen. Amen. Amen. Amen. Amen. Amen. Amen. Amen. Amen. Amen.